Hello and welcome to the Criminal Law Online Lecture. If you could please take out your Issue Recognition Outline, which is under your Introduction tab in Volume 1, and turn to the Criminal Law and Procedure section. That's a chart that looks like this. Let me explain to you a little bit about this chart. I didn't mention it within the introduction video, but I will talk about it now briefly. This chart is something that I compiled with another attorney friend of mine. And what we did was take every single exam in the past about 12 years um, or, or more, depending on when you're watching this video, and we went through every single subject and every essay that was tested and listed every single issue that came up for that essay. So what you will see, and, and the importance of us doing that, was to really let you um, see that there's a lot of repetition within these, these subjects. These same issues do come up over and over and over again because you don't need to memorize 50 to 60 page outlines per subject to really understand where the examiners potentially can go here. So I'm going to guide you as well as this IRO to really zone in and focus on what gets tested. So if you turn, since, since this is the criminal law video, if you turn to your IRO in regards to criminal law, you will see that there are a number of areas that come up a lot. Now it's important to note that criminal law highly crosses over with criminal procedure. That's probably one of the most crossed over areas and nine out of 10 times if criminal law is tested, so is criminal procedure, either within another call of the question or in, in it of itself with a general question. So let's turn to, again, your criminal law IRO and what do you see? What comes up in both criminal law and criminal procedure? Number one, homicide. Homicide is highly tested. It's usually due to be tested if it hasn't been tested within the last two or three bars. Um, so what is homicide? Homicide has four types, first degree murder, second degree common law murder, involuntary homicide, and voluntary homicide. You must know your homicide essay approach that we'll go over in a moment. What else comes up within criminal law? Well, we have conspiracy, and just like the preliminary crime, so conspiracy, attempt, solicitation, accomplice liability, those are areas that you must know very, very well. And I'll point those out in a moment within your long outline as well, but you have to make sure there could be a fact pattern where the call of the question just simply asks you what crimes, if any, can Dan be convicted of or held guilty of? And you have to literally just list all the potential crimes. And it could be everything but homicide. So it's very important to know your crimes and rules and elements supporting those crimes. It's also important to know any potential defenses. The defenses come up a lot. Are there any specific defenses that are tested a lot? Yes. If you go to your IRO, you will see that intoxication comes up as well as self-defense. Self-defense is a key defense. Make sure you know the rules there very, very well. Now, if you turn the page on your approach over to page two, again, you'll see that homicide is highly tested. Kidnapping is one of those floater areas that does come up from time to time, so I would know the rules there, but you really need to know all the rules. Your criminal law outline is really only 14, 15 pages. There's no reason not to know all the rules for criminal law. On top of it, if you are not an attorney applicant and you are required to take the MBE portion of the exam, then you also really must know these rules because especially for like property crimes and crimes against um, individuals, and really even the um, incomplete offenses, those all come up on the MBE portion as well, as including their exceptions and considerations within each area. So that's really just a basic overview of what gets tested. If you can now take out your criminal law long outline, within your criminal law long outline tab, I'm gonna point out some other areas that I really want you to know. So if you go to page one, you'll see merger of crimes. Merger of crimes is highly tested. It's important to note that conspiracy does not merge with the substantive offense. 
You can be guilty of conspiracy to commit a crime and the crime itself, so both. Now, it's also important to note that conspiracy alone is a crime, and you may have also the underlying crime to be guilty of as well for the defendant. That's important there. However, solicitation and attempt merge into the substantive offense. That gets tested almost every single time on the MBE for crimes. So make sure you understand the laws in regards to merger. If you turn the page, you'll see a list of mental states and intents. These are very important to know. They're part of the homicide crimes, the, the actual level of state of mind that a defendant needs to carry out the crime or be found, I'm sorry, be found guilty of the crime. So you must know these mental states. There's specific intent crimes, malice, general intent, and strict liability. You turn the page, you'll see that there's a section on accomplice liability. A number of times on the exam, the examiners will ask, can one individual, so let's call him Ron, okay, I'll diagram it for you here on the board. Let's say we have Donald, we have Ronald, and Vic. D is obviously the defendant and Vic. But what about Ronald? Who's Ronald? Well, Donald carries out, let's say, the felony murder. He actually pulls the gun. Victor is the victim that dies. Who's Ronald? Well, let's say Ronald conspired with Donald to commit the felony murder or to commit the underlying felony that ends up leading to the felony murder. Can Ronald, and the issue is, can Ronald be hailed, what, vicariously liable for the acts of Donald even though Ronald did not pull the trigger? So if the call of the question asks you something along those lines, i.e., can Ronald be held guilty for the crimes or for the acts of Donald, automatically the issue is accomplice liability within a crimes context. Vicarious liability floats through a lot of subjects on the California bar exam. It comes up in torts, it comes up in agency. Within crimes, it's accomplice liability is synonymous with that vicarious liability, the acts of another being thrown onto one. So did not pull the trigger, the issue is accomplice liability. With that being said, you must know the rules for accomplice liability, heavily tested on both the essay and the MBE portion of the exam. Then you have your incomplete offenses, Solic solicitation, attempt, and conspiracy. You must know the rules for them. Now, if they come up, there's no separate essay approach for them because it's not necessary. You can use both your short and long form approach and writing style to write for these types of offenses. And literally what you do is you give a heading, conspiracy. Now remember, whether it's conspiracy, whether it's solicitation, or whether it's attempt. You always want to put in your heading what the underlying crime is. So conspiracy for murder or solicitation for burglary. I think you got the hint. You always want to put that. And what you would do is you use your intro, introduce the elements for those crimes, and then subsequently headnote them and go into the rules and give your analysis plus conclusion. You can separate them out in your long form or in a paragraph depending on how much time you have. If this is a racehorse crimes question, you may want to use your short form under each element 
i.e. issue, slash issue, okay? So, must know your incomplete crimes. Very important. Common law crimes, crimes against the person, battery and assault come together. If there is an assault, automatically think of battery, battery automatically think of a potential assault. We have the sex offenses, rape. Rape gets tested a lot on the MBEs and it's also a floater miscellaneous issue on the essays as well. Make sure you know your rules in regards to rape. They try and get you with lack of effectual consent. That is an area that students tend to neglect in their studying. The rules are here, know them. Now we have some miscellaneous sexual offenses, statutory rape, crimes against nature, seduction and bigamy. These are also fair game. These can come up as floaters as well on the essays and the MBE. Kidnapping, know the rule. And then we get to homicide. Now it's important to note that if there is a supporting essay approach for a certain area when you get to your long outline, I still want you to read the rules and know the rules within the long outline because remember I'm focusing on where they test but make sure that you're memorizing from the approach because the approach is what's going to guide you into how to organize everything, your rules, your issues, even your analysis and conclusions. So we're on homicide now. If you can turn to your homicide essay approach and take that out, that's under your homicide tab in volume one. Now homicide seems pretty straightforward, but it's messed up on all the time. So this approach will definitely get you through an entire homicide essay or if the call of the question is just asking for a specific type of homicide. So let's talk about that for a second. You may just have a general question like, can Dan be convicted of murder or any of the four types of homicide? Or it may specifically, which it's more likely to do, say, can Dan be convicted or held guilty of first degree murder, second degree murder, voluntary manslaughter, so on and so forth. If you ever want to look at a really straightforward homicide essay that has been tested, go to February 2007. The criminal law question within that year tested a straight homicide essay. But a lot of times you may not get just a straight homicide essay and you may see a crossover with a criminal procedure called the question as well. So that's why it's important to first look at the questions to see where the examiners are going. But no matter what, this approach will help you to any situation, whatever the examiners are asking you with the homicide question. So, first area is first degree murder. So Dan for first degree. We have our long form intro. If you go to your approach, you'll see it says first degree murder occurs when the defendant commits a killing that was intentional, premeditated, and deliberate. Those are your elements. And then you skip a line under your intro and you head note and go into each element individually. So we first need an intentional killing. Intentional killing is one done with the specific intent to take the life of another. It seems straightforward intent, but you still must give a rule for a specific intent. So you give the rule, skip a line, and your analysis. Now don't be conclusory, conclusory here. Don't say that Dan possessed the specific intent to kill because he killed him. That's not going to be a concise and thorough analysis. Give some setting and background, assuming the facts give you that. The next element necessary for first degree murder is time to reflect. First degree murder requires time to reflect upon the killing. This is commonly known as premeditation. Premeditation requires merely a moment's reflection upon the killing. Again, you give your rule and your analysis and go into it. Understand the rule for time to reflect. And last, cool and dispassionate. Go 
give a rule for cool and dispassionate. The defendant must have committed the killing in a cool and dispassionate manner. What does that mean? That means the defendant killed another person in a calm and calculated manner without passion. Calm and calculated. Otherwise known as the premeditated murder, right? Lying and waiting, watching your victim. You'll be able to pretty much tell if it's first degree murder with the facts. It should really be very clear to you. Now, if it's not clear, that's where your analysis will be a little bit more meaty. You're really going to have to go into whether or not there was that time to reflect and cool and dispassionate. And at the end, don't forget any potential defenses. Don't forget to go into any potential defenses for each charge of homicide. So that's first degree murder. What about second degree common law murder? If you go to page two of your approach, we have our intro. So we have Dan for second degree. And we always start with our intro. What do we need? We need an act, causation, malice, and the absence of any applicable defenses. That's our intro. You can use that introductory paragraph every single time. In line with our introduction, we need an act, causation. Now, causation is, is the same as it is in negligence, but it's typically not going to be as drawn out and full-blown as it is in negligence. You can really get to the point here, typically. You need actual and proximate. You don't need to separately headnote them in a homicide second-degree murder approach, but you should established that the defendant's act was both the actual and proximate cause of the of the victim's death. If there is a break in the chain of events that from the defendant to the victim, you may have a proximate causation issue here. And I have seen that happen on various fact patterns. So it's important to make sure you're establishing here both actual and proximate causation. Next, you have to establish malice. Now, any one of the four types of malice will suffice for a second degree murder conviction. But there's a trick to know which ones you have to go into. So the first three types of malice will always come together. Intent to kill, intent to inflict great bodily injury, and reckless disregard. Those will all three need to be discussed. If one is at issue, that means the other two are at issue. So we have intent to kill. Intent to inflict great bodily injury and reckless disregard. However, it's important to note that the defense for intent to kill of whom? Of the defendant is going to be what? The defendant did not intend to kill. The defendant was provoked. So the defense for intent to kill is voluntary manslaughter, which we'll get into in a moment. But sometimes the call of the question will say, can Dan be convicted of second degree murder or any lesser included offenses or any lesser charges? That should kind of ring that you still need to go into a second degree murder approach, but intent to kill may be negated by voluntary manslaughter, a provocation. Now, what about reckless indifference? Reckless indifference will be negated by what? Involuntary manslaughter criminal homicide. So these are going to be your lesser included offenses, your lesser charges. These will negate malice for intent to kill and reckless disregard. It's really important to note that. So again, that's your hint. If one of these are at issue, the first three types of malice, then all of them must be separately head noted and separately gone into. 
Now, what if we have a felony murder? Felony murder is the fourth type of malice. And I'm going to erase the first degree murder part so I can go into how you would approach felony murder. Now you're on second degree, again, second degree common law murder. You're in the area of malice. If, felon, if this is a felony murder, if the defendant had the intent to carry out a da inherently dangerous felony, one of the enumerated inherently dangerous felonies, and with, while carrying out that felony, the defendant, bam, killed the teller, okay, during the robbery of the bank. Automatically, you know that the first three types of malice are not at issue. However, you want to be full circle, and you want to introduce them, and then quickly shoot them down. So you say, heading malice, and in an intro form, you say, in order to prove malice, you need an intent to kill, and you introduce all four types, period. However, here, however, here, so you introduce all four, and then you say, however, here, comma, the intent was to commit the felony, the robbery, the inherently dangerous felony. And therefore, the type of malice necessary is the felony murder rule. The felony murder rule will apply here. And therefore, the first three types of malice are not at issue. Really important to state that because you want the grader to know that you're just negating or you're just throwing out the first three types as being applicable. You're going to go straight into now your felony murder analysis. So your next heading right under that paragraph will be felony murder. Very concise, organized, and to the point. If you turn to your felony murder approach on page three, you'll see how straightforward this approach really is. Any death caused during the commission of or in the attempt to commit a felony is murder. Mouse is implied by the defendant's intent to commit a felony. And there are several limitations that you have to go into. Go into all of the limitations. So you give your intro. And you always remember that the intent is to commit the felony, not the murder. The, melony, the murder is subsequent to the felony. So first, you establish that the defendant is guilty of the underlying felony. I'm actually going to just do a quick thing here. We're in homicide within felony murder. I want this to be really clear because felony murder gets tested a lot. Your heading was Dan for second degree or common law murder. You gave an intro for act causation, malice, and no defenses, no applicable defenses. You're, you go into act, you go into causation, you make sure that both of these are met. Now, even if they're not, you still go on, which they likely will be. And then you have a heading, malice. Since we're in felony murder, even though we don't have a felony murder heading yet, we just give a short form paragraph and let the grader know that the first three types of malice are not at issue because the intent was to carry out an inherently dangerous felony. And therefore, the felony murder rule applies. And you can go right into your felony murder heading. Felony murder. I would even put it in all caps. You give your intro for felony murder, which is stated on your approach, and then you go into your considerations that you must prove. First, the defendant must be guilty of the underlying felony. Students miss this a lot. First, you have to prove to the grader that the defendant is guilty of the underlying felony. So that's where you have to know those 
felonies and you have to know the rules for those felonies. Here, first establish that the felony was inherently dangerous. In most jurisdictions, the enumerated felonies are arson, robbery, burglary, rape, mayhem, and kidnapping. Second, state what the elements for that felony are and whether the defendant is guilty of them. Most students lose points here. You must establish the elements of the underlying felony first. So let's say you've established them, you determine that they're met in an analysis, and now you go into distinct from the killing. This is typically a really short analysis. The felony must be distinct from the killing itself, i.e. has to be a robbery, or a burglary. Short analysis here. Next, foreseeability. The death must have been the foreseeable result of the felony. This is a lengthy and meaty analysis. Don't be conclusory here. Don't say that the death was foreseeable because the defendant brought a bank into the uh, a, a bank a gun into the bank. Don't do that. That's conclusory. Why was it foreseeable? Why is it foreseeable that going into a bank in the middle of the day with a lot of people around with a gun could end up, there could end up being a killing because of those actions? You have to make sure that you're really supporting this foreseeability standard. And that's whenever foreseeability or reasonableness comes up on the exam. Really make this a meaty analysis. Why was it foreseeable? Maybe there was a, an officer within the bank protecting it with a gun, right? There's other circumstances that could lead to this foreseeability being met. Next, we have to establish during the commission of the felony, the death must have occurred during the commission of the felony and not after it was terminated. This is highly tested on the MBE, and this is a huge issue sometimes on the essays as well. So really make sure you understand this rule. It's pretty straightforward. Remembers that murders which occur while the defendant is fleeing the scene or from the cops do count. Also on page four, the first note is important. In most jurisdictions, the defendant is not liable for felony murder when a co-felon is killed as a result of resistance from the felony victim or the police. There's also an agency theory and proximate cause theory in regards to an innocent party being killed. It's a jurisdictional issue and you must know the rules. When there's a note within the approach, that means that's an area that has been tested. It may not always come up, but it's a rule that tends to come up and I want you to know about it. So please make sure you know those rules. Next and last, you discuss any potential defenses to felony murder. So we're on a felony murder just to give a little overview. We go act, causation, malice, short paragraph, just telling the grader that the first three types of malice do not apply because the intent was to carry out an inherently dangerous felony and therefore the felony murder rule applies. And then you go right into the felony murder rule, you give an intro as to what it is and then go into its considerations limitations. We make sure that the defendant is guilty of the underlying felony, we make sure that the kill, that the felony was distinct from the killing. We have a foreseeability factor that needs a me pretty meaty, at least a one and a half to two paragraph analysis. We make sure that the killing occurred during the commission of the felony and not when what? When the defendant had already reached a place of safe harbor. That's the standard there. And then last, we discuss any potential defenses. It's really important to have this felony murder rule approach down because it gets tested a lot within the area of homicide. Last, you have two additional forms of homicide, voluntary manslaughter. If you turn to that on page four, it's important to note that heat of passion is not the defense. Heat of passion can be used to prove the defense, but it's not your heading. It's not your standard. Your standard is sufficient provocation. That's your standard here. 
So your first heading will be Dan for voluntary manslaughter. And I'm just abbreviating for teaching purposes. You should spell out the entire heading. And you have an intro. Voluntary manslaughter is an intentional killing which consists of a provocation that would arouse intense passion in the mind of an ordinary person. The defendant, in fact, was provoked. There was no reasonable time for the defendant to cool between the provocation and the killing. And the defendant, in fact, did not cool. Pretty, pretty simple. The biggest analysis here, after you just introduce the elements, is whether or not there was sufficient provocation. That's really your standard. And it's important that you don't go just right into heat of passion. Heat of passion is not always the issue here. Heat of passion is typically when a spouse finds another in the bed with somebody else, something of that nature. It's what we think of as voluntary manslaughter and provocation, but it could be really a bar fight being provoked by maybe um, the defendant saying nasty remarks or nasty words, right, and provoking you. So it may not be heat of passion. However, sufficient provocation is defined is one that would arise intense passion in the mind of an ordinary person, causing him or her to lose self-control. So your standard is an ordinary person, me or you, is what the defendant did what an ordinary person would have done. Is, are the acts that caused this potential provocation sufficient in the mind of an ordinary person to have lost it? Okay, because let's say the victim was taunting you or uh, maybe following you or harming your child, right? So that maybe would invoke sufficient provocation, but you have to establish that. It's a reasonableness test. Is what the defendant did reasonableness? Would most people have been provoked? That's important. Ask yourself, would most people have been provoked here? And go into it. So this is probably going to be your most lengthy analysis. Then you go into the defendant was in fact provoked. Well, that's pretty straightforward if you've determined that there's sufficient provocation. No reasonable time to cool. That gets tested a lot on the MBEs. There was not sufficient time between the provocation and killing for passions of a reasonable person to cool. So look at the timing aspect there. Last, the defendant did not cool. This occurs where the defendant, in fact, did not cool off between the provocation and the killing. If the facts show that the defendant cooled down, there is no reduction to manslaughter. This is key as well. So I would say defendant did not cool and sufficient provocation, the most two important elements here. But again, you must satisfy all of them for voluntary manslaughter. And remember that voluntary manslaughter is what will negate intent to kill malice for second degree common law murder. And then last, we consider always any applicable defenses. So it's a pretty straightforward approach for voluntary manslaughter. The last charge of homicide that we'll go into, or that there is, is involuntary manslaughter. Now, voluntary, involuntary manslaughter has two ways that it can be proven. A killing is involuntary manslaughter. If you look at page five of your approach, if it was committed with criminal negligence, so that's where the reckless indifference, the third type of malice for second degree common law murder will be negated to criminal negligence. It's where the defendant was grossly negligent or during the commission of an inherently dangerous misdemeanor. So really just give our intro and we only have the criminal negligence or inherently dangerous misdemeanor. And I get asked all the time, what's an inherently dangerous misdemeanor? Really anything that's not an inherently dangerous felony. Everything left over. Now, always remember your defenses at the end. 
So that's your approach for involuntary manslaughter. And you must know the approach for all four types of homicide. It's really important to know this approach, go through it, use it when you're writing for homicide. I will be looking to see if you're following it. And if you're not, you're going to know because I'll be putting it in my feedback and the grader will be putting it in her feedback as well. So you really must make sure that you know and you understand this approach to homicide. Homicide gets tested a lot. Now, if you go back to your long criminal law, long outline, we're going to skip over homicide since we just covered it, but there may be some additional rules that I want you to make sure you know. Read through the homicide essay, um, excuse me, the homicide, homicide portion of the long outline. Really important to read that as well. Now you'll see that at the bottom of page 8 you have your property crimes. I want you to know them. Larceny is highly tested, highly, highly tested on the bar exam in California. Embezzlement comes up. False pretenses comes up. Robbery comes up. Extortion. And as we just saw with the felony murder rule, you really must know the rules for the inherently dangerous felonies that I enumerated during the approach. Make sure you know the rules there in case the felony murder rule do, does come up and you have to establish that inherently dangerous felony. If you turn the page, you have receipt of stolen property, property forgery, and malicious, malicious mischief all come up. Then you have your offenses against habitation, burglary, and arson highly tested on the MBE portion of the exam. You have some miscellaneous judicial procedure offenses that I want you to know. Perjury, subordination of perjury, bri bribery, compounding a crime, and misprison of a felony. Bo all of those could come up as one of those floater miscellaneous areas. So you must know them because I don't, it would be minor points if they came up, but I don't want you to miss even minor points here. Last, you have your defenses. Know all of these defenses. The most important ones, insanity. Insanity has four parts. All four types of the insanity defenses, if asked for, need to be discussed and separately head noted. So you have your McNaughton rule, irresistible impulse test, Durham test and model penal code test. Unless the call of the question is asking you for a specific insanity defense, discuss all four types and go into their rule and the analysis. Intoxication, voluntary and involuntary, both are highly tested. Self-defense, highly, highly tested. Must know your self-defense rules, defense of others, defense of a dwelling, defense of other property, crime prevention, use of force to effectuate arrest, otherwise known as a citizen's arrest, that also has come up. Duress, mistake of fact, mistake of law, consent, entrapment. All of these defenses have been tested. They could come up to negate homicide or negate another crime. You must know these defenses. So that you know pretty much wraps up criminal law. Um, obviously, the most tested area within criminal law is homicide. But again, there can be a free-for-all, as there was a bar ago, for all crimes that the defendant could possibly be found guilty of, aside from homicide. So you really do need to know all the elements and rules for each potential crime. Again, if you ever have any questions, please bring them to my attention. That wraps up crimes for today, and I will see you in criminal procedure. Thank you.